This is Training Insights, Episode 17. Hi, and welcome to Training Insights. This is Episode 17. My name is Kevin McGowan, and of course, this podcast is brought to you by Training Magazine. Go to trainingmag.com. Have you ever been lost in the desert? Trying to find water or other supplies? Chances are you probably haven't, but uh, today I'm going to speak with Phil Geldard. He is the founder and CEO of Eagles Flight Consulting, based in Guelph, Ontario, Canada. And that's how, actually, he started his business. Now, not literally, mind you, but I'll let him tell the story. I had a great conversation with Phil about how he started his business and how he keeps on top of things and avoids the whole flavor of the month training trends. So sit back, relax, enjoy my conversation with Phil Geldard. Okay, and Phil Geldard, welcome to Training Insights. Thanks, Kevin. Great to be here. And you, you, you're the founder and CEO of Eagles Flight. It's a really cool name, I first of all want to say. But uh, can yeah, you tell me you. how how you decided to create the company and and why you chose the name? <laughs> well, everybody thinks we actually train pilots. In fact, I got an invitation to go to a pilot seminar just yesterday. So <laughs> we do not train pilots. The uh, the name actually came, this makes absolutely no sense, but I had a great friend who worked in Colorado in a dude ranch in the Rocky Mountains, and I thought, I would love to work in a dude ranch in Colorado. And since I couldn't, and I ended up creating a training company, and I needed a name for it, I had a picture of this eagle flying over the dude ranch. <laughs> so I said, I'll have to call my training company Eagle Flight because it would be remind me of the fact that I thought I'd like to be working at a dude ranch in Colorado. So kind of a weird way to come up with a name. But it's actually, it served us in great stead. I think partly it's easy to remember people, it's not typical. And the eagle is so symbolic of so many things that we do that it's turned out serendipitously to be a great name, but it wasn't wasn't done with a lot of thought at the time. So <laughs> I, I think that's pretty common for most businesses, especially you know nowadays too. A lot of people are just trying to find something that nobody's claimed the domain name yet. <laughs> something yeah, like that. Well, that's, that's true. My grandmother used to say, uh, pick the rut you're in carefully because you'll be in it a long time. She told it to me when I was too young to appreciate the comment, but I get it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So, so, so it, we... it, Yeah, how did it start? It was interesting. I, I was working in a corporation in the training function, and they allowed me to start a company in my spare time. And I thought that it would be really fun to start a training company. And the 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 real reason was because I was having success with the company I was with at the time. And it just seemed like a natural extension. And we started off at the time, Kevin, I had this great idea for leadership training that you'd put this these little cards in a box and you'd put the box on the desk and every week you'd check out a new card and it would be one principle around leadership. Hmm. And uh, so I hired a guy and, of course, I was making no money because I was really junior at the time. And so I hired a guy with after-tax dollars, put him in my basement, and we created these cards in the box, and off he went. And a year later, we hadn't sold a single box. I, I think we sold one to one, one friend of his who just took pity on us. <laughs> so he, he said, this is not working. And I thought, okay, well, yeah, this is clearly not working. And we were down to our last few pennies. And he said, you've got anything else you can sell. And... I had invented or developed some games um, that I was using in my training in this other corporation. And because I felt, you know, training is just so boring most of the time. You, people fall asleep in the class or they're doing something else. It's death by PowerPoint. And I had felt that there'd got to be a better way to train. So mm. the first game I invented was something called Gold of the Desert Kings. And what it was was it was a race across the desert. But to be successful, you really had to be good. You had to be great at planning, had to be great at information processing and teamwork and things like that. So what I would do is I would put people in the class, and they'd walk in, and they'd think they were going to your typical boring class, and within three minutes, they were playing this desert game. So they had a lot of fun. They loved it. They had no idea why they were playing it, and then I debriefed it. But I could debrief it against their experience which is very cool because you can't say, well, this is a role play or a case. It's like you. You played the game and look at how you did and I had all the metrics. 
and typically they didn't do very well. So I said, okay, so do you think you would like to do better in the game because the principles that are going to make you great in the game are going to make you great at work? And they loved it. Wow. So, yeah, it was really cool, Kevin. It was very cool. And that thing just took off. And everybody in the company went through it, and they loved it, and they learned, and those trainings stuck. And I sort of inadvertently stumbled on the power of conviction as a component of the training process. So instead of me just telling you something and you trying to remember it, if I can build conviction first in some way that there's value in learning or you need to learn or there's a gap between what you do and what you know and so on, then people are much more willing to learn to close that gap and get better. So that's, that's really... Sorry, I'll, I'll sorry, just want to cut, cut you off for a sec. Um, no. The, the, the whole notion of conviction, I've always heard, you know, intrinsic motivation, extrinsic motivation, that kind of thing. I've never thought of it in terms of conviction. That, that, yeah. That's kind of a light bulb for me. So how, how do you, how did this game impact these people or how do your other methods yep. get people well, that engaged so they're convinced that they're in it like that? Okay, so let, let me give you an example. If I take the desert game just as an example, mm-hmm. if, you, if you sit down with five folks at the table and you have no idea what you're doing other than the fact that facilitator says we're going to race across the desert. So you immediately look around, okay, who am I racing against? So you're, you now have this competition because there's all these other tables. Mm-hmm. And we say that you're going to start at home base, and the desert in front of you is basically, think of it as a, a map with squares on it. And the, the squares are sort of random, but they're all contiguous. And you can move from one square to another, so you're kind of like stepping stones. And every year is three minutes. So you have, sorry, every day is three minutes. So every three minutes you get to make a move and you have a total of 25 days. So the, you do the quick math and you go, okay, I'm going to be doing this for three times 25. There's 75 minutes worth of gameplay and I can make a move every minute. It seems pretty straightforward. And you go, yeah, yeah. And your goal is to leave home base and get to the mountains. And the mountains are six squares away if you go the most direct route. So you right. can literally count, okay, six. And every day that you're in the mountains, you get one bar of gold, and then you can bring it back. So people quickly go, okay, I get 12, 25 days, when did they do that? So I'll go up, I'll stay, I'll collect the gold, I'll come back. And we say, well, right. remember you're in competition, so the first team back can sell their gold for more than the second team, who can sell it more than for the third team, just to replicate the idea of sort of supply and demand in the marketplace. Right. But before you go, a couple things you need to know. One is you got to buy food and water because every day you're in the desert, you consume water and you consume food. So you've got some money and there's a bank over here. You go buy whatever food and water you need. And on the route to the desert, there are oases. So if you feel you run out of water, you can kind of go to the oasis. Now, here's the first thing, Kevin. Huh. You think, okay, it's six squares up. But to go to the oasis, you have to deviate off the most direct route. So if you go to the oasis on the way up, it's going to take you eight squares. And if you go to the oasis on the way down, you're going to take another eight squares. So you immediately wiped out four of your moves. And you wouldn't <laughs> people go, why would I spend money on the water? I, I can get it for free. So first major... Because later, then I can debrief it and say, why didn't you take, you already, before you began, you chose to take a route that was not the most direct. You're not going to optimize. You you were guaranteed to do less than what was possible. And they go, oh, yeah, you're right. So why was that? So that's a way of building conviction. Because now when I talk to them about think more carefully about your choices and the consequences of the choices, they go, yeah, mm. that's your right. So... And you another really thing, you really hook them there. Oh yeah, you do. And there's because the race actually is a red herring because the amount of money that you save by coming back first is immaterial. It just gets people thinking the wrong way. Right. But another thing we do is I say when you're before you start, there's an old, old sage. He's very old, and he's um very slow, and he's very lonely, but he knows stuff about the desert. Yeah. So you can talk to him, but every day you talk to him, you only get one piece of information. So you got to give up one of your 25 days, and he knows four things. So they go, okay, wait a minute. This guy is old and lonely. 
I don't know whether this stuff thing. <laughs> We're not going to bother talking to them. So they don't talk to them. So you think, who in their right mind never played the game before and knows nothing about the desert is going to jump off without talking to someone who at least can tell you something about the desert? Nobody talks to the old man. Mm-hmm. So they are in such a rush to leave that they don't get the information. And as a result of not getting the information, they never take the most direct route. They, they, the problems are huge. So in the debrief, we say, so why didn't you talk to the old man? Well, you know, we were in a rush, and that's the way we are in the real world. We, we kind of think, let's get started and figure out as we go. Yeah. Say, well, how does that work for you? Well, that wasn't really, it doesn't really work well in the real world. Okay, so <laughs> let me show you yeah. how to do better. So you begin to create these metaphors in the experience that stick with you for years. I should never do anything without getting all the information before I do it. Right. Uh, and, and typically, just in that experience, if you think actually that you have a camel and uh, the, the camel can only carry so much. So in practice, the best you can do is 10 bars of gold. Mm-hmm. And 30%, and we probably put, I don't know, we did the math once, but it's something like a quarter of a million people around the world have been through this game. About 30% die. They don't even make it back. And of the remainder, most get two to three to four bars of gold. So yeah. it is it's like, it's they go, I, unbelievable. This is the way I operate every day. So you have this huge conviction about, I have just had a mirror held up to me, and I could do something about that, and if you can show me how, that would be great. So we right. kind of till the soil to drop in the seeds of learning. So, and to come back to the Eagles Flight story, I was using that game, and when we were down to our last penny, the guy in the basement said, I'll try to sell that. <laughs> I said, okay, and it <laughs> took off. Everybody loved it. That's and uh, so Eagles Flight was born around experiential learning, and now we've got dozens of games like that. So pretty cool. So, so you were really, I mean, gamification literally before gamification was a thing. Absolutely. <laughs> yep. So you always and now knew we have that, lots of them. Well, you you always yep. knew, or you, you predicted, I guess, anyway, that this was, I mean, a great way to get people to understand something. And experiential learning is also generally just a great way of of getting it because people are motivated and they 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 want that and they can apply something to their work to their life kind of immediately. Yeah, and I think you put your finger on the key point. If you don't have a really good debrief that lets them apply it to their work or their life, it's just a game. Because I think the big difference between what we do and what a lot of people call experiential learning is the learning is embedded in the game. So I know what they're going to learn before they start, as opposed to, you know, a ropes course where, you hope you learn something about team building. It's an experience, but you can't guarantee the outcome. So that's the big difference, I think. Because if you don't have a really powerful debrief, you're stuck. And for a powerful debrief, you need a powerful experience. So uh, I have to ask, um, you've done this with you know, thousands upon thousands of people, or your company has. Yeah. Um, how, what, what's your percentage of seeing that light bulb? And what's the percentage of people who, are there people who are resistant? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I think I'm just imagining it's, that that tough student in the class with their arms full in the back of the room. Like, yeah. do they get this? They, oh they, yeah, they oh like yeah, it? yeah, yeah. Uh, I I would say you can have as many as twenty percent. Well, probably there's twenty. There, you could have as many as twenty percent that either physically or metaphorically have their arms crossed. Right. And I'll bet you there's forty percent that are reluctant participants but don't show it. And the remaining, this is pretty cool. When it is done, I would say we've got 99% of the room rock solid engaged within yeah. within about seven minutes because it's so compelling. We've literally had guys walk into the room, typically in a more hostile environment, but right. we say, I've got to be here, and they turn their chair so the back is facing the facilitator and they cross their arms. And then the people around them are playing, and they look over their shoulder, and they look a little more, then they turn around, and always, Kevin, at the end, the folks are so engaged. So I I would say probably 95% end up where you would hope they would be. There's always a few that are stand-up, but by and large, it's very compelling. 
And, yeah. and the beauty is it works for all ages, all cultures, because you're you, right? I mean, you don't have to worry about you, you're you. Now, in yeah. Asia, we tend to be a little less competitive because they're more worried about face. Mm-hmm. So we downplay the competitive nature. But everywhere else around the world, they just go through it and they get the learning they get. That's wild. I, I mean, it, you've been doing this a long time. Um, yeah, yeah. And I, and I can hear in your voice you're still really passionate about it. Why is this a passion for you? Why is this why is it still click for you? Yeah, it's another great question. Um, I, I think let me answer that by backtracking one thing. Sure. If the if the goal is to change behavior, and that's really the point I'm going to come to in a minute, but mm-hmm. if the goal is to change behavior, you need to do four things. You, you need to get people's heart or conviction, right? They've got to want to change. Otherwise, so I have my grandkids around, and when they're around, the house is just a mess. So <laughs> if, if you don't love the you, kids, yeah. <laughs> you're not going to live with the mess. You've yeah. got to love the kids, but then the mess is irrelevant. So we are kind of, we live as human beings as basically passionate people. So to change my behavior, there's got to be some heart or passion there, which is what experiential learning does. But the second thing you need is you get their head. So heart and head. And the head says, okay, I, I get that I should change, but you've got to show me how. And it's still pretty theoretical, but at least I get it. The yeah. third thing you've got to do is what we call hands. And that's now you've got to show me how to make the theoretical practical. So that's the hands. And then the fourth is what we call harvest. So heart, head, hands, harvest. And harvest means realistically, especially in the world that we are in, companies are not paying for training for the good of their health. They are expecting to see shareholder value or improved service or something. So mm-hmm. if you don't link the first three to some kind of result at the end, it doesn't it isn't worth very much. So those four things really make up the core of Eagle Flight. So if you ask me why I'm excited, what excites me is being able to change behavior. So we do a lot of leadership training. And if I if I can help a leader be better, Kevin, he's better or she's better. The people working for her are better. They don't have heart attacks. They don't go home and complain about their boss being an idiot. The implications <laughs> on the company are huge, you know? Yeah. Like, okay, I'm not working for Attila the Hun. I'm working for someone who actually cares about me and, and knows how to use me and use my potential and makes me feel valued. And the ripple effect is huge. So that I am really committed to, to be able to make a difference in the lives of people like that. So to do that, we have tools. One of the tools is experiential learning, which is why I get excited about experiential learning. So it's more because it's a stepping stone across the river than the fact that the stone itself is so cool, although it is cool. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. I'm just, I'm, 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 my mind is boggling a little bit. So I, I want to ask you so many more questions, but I <laughs> really have time, I think, for one. <laughs> okay, uh, no problem. Whatever you um, think. In terms of you know, organizational cultural transformation, yep. if you were just saying that you know the organization obviously they they have a bottom line issue they're either lacking in efficiency yep. or the culture is suffering or whatever there, there's some financial bottom line issue that needs to be fixed and they can fix it with behaviors or just cultural transformation. Exactly. Um, how yep. do you how do you get into that that space and start applying? Uh, the, this whole model, this game, experiential learning model, and, and make that stick with with somebody who might be, not maybe not that person who's who's got their arms crossed in the back of the room, but might be might be that manager who's just not getting it, who needs help. Yeah. How do they transition with this kind of help? Okay, um, I know it's a big question, but I'm just I'm yeah, no, it is. I, I mean, it, and <laughs> it, it is a. Uh, it's, it's insightful because most people think you can just put them in the classroom and the job is done. So you mm-hmm. really put your finger on the, the issue, I think. And just to simplify it for the sake of the discussion, there are re- you need four things. The third thing is the training and the experiential learning. So mm-hmm. you need to get them so they actually know how to change their behavior. So that is right. point number three. Point number four is just because we are human beings, we tend to forget fairly quickly or we get busy and anything that we learn tends to kind of get lost with the next big thing that comes to mind. So Mm -hmm. if you're going to change a culture, point number three, you need to change the behavior and point number four, you need to do things to keep those new behaviors alive for a couple of years. 
So we build a sustaining component after the training. So without that sustaining component, you're toast. So I'll often say to a company, I'd rather you pay me to do less training and put the rest of the money on sustaining than give them a ton of stuff that they're going to forget. So point number three, you need the behavior change, but point number four, you need to sustain it. But really, three and four only work with one and two. And number one is you've got to have senior management committed. If, if senior management is unwilling to support that transformation, no matter how badly I want to do it as an employee or a leader in the company, if I feel that the organizational head does not support it, the executive team are actually not serious about it. So you want me to, to operate in a safe environment, but you really don't care much about safety yourself. You walk into our factory and you never wear a hard hat, you never worry about, you never talk about safety, then yeah. you're obviously not committed or you talk about an empowered organization, but you never give me a chance to contribute. So if you don't have senior management, you're toast. That's point number one. And then point number two is it's all very well for me to feel and believe that senior management is committed, but my boss is you. You're the guy I report to every day. So I'm looking to you, and you have to actually exemplify what you want me to behave. You have to kind of be a model. And you have to be willing to help me when I don't get it right. So you, as my line manager, have to be a model. You have to be a coach. And you have to be pretty committed to make sure that I do it and not let me get away with not doing what it is that I'm supposed to do, which is what we call require. So as a line manager, they have to model, coach, and require the culture. So if you have senior management committed, the line manager model coaching requiring, teach me to change my behavior and stick with it for a couple of years, then you get the transformation. So that's kind of the process that we follow and preach. Fantastic. So it's not something that you can just go and send everybody to that two-day course and no. get everything fixed. No. Because that's no. the notion and that you hear occasionally of people, oh, yeah, everybody's going to be fine. They went to training and whatever, exactly. Toronto for two days, and everything's good now. <laughs> yeah, and that's where you get the flavor of the month coming in. Yeah. So we will not be flavor of the month, but we know how not to. But you know what? Really, If you don't have that experiential component in the middle, you can't build conviction. So all those other steps are just going to vanish as soon as leadership changes, right? People go, oh, well, new leadership, what do they want? As opposed to, no, I know what's right and I believe it for myself. I'm going to keep doing it even if the world around me changes. That, then you have real transformation. Well, Phil, that's a perfect place to leave it off. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for the time. Thank you so much, Phil Geldart of Eagles Flight. If you're uh, if you're interested in more, obviously you can go to their website. Everybody's got one of those, uh, EaglesFlight.com. And I want to thank you for listening. And if you would like to be on a future episode of Training Insights, drop me a line. You can go to kevinmcgowan.ca and you can uh, send me an email from there. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time. <laughs>